Recently, Joyce had to be away at the ELCA Milwaukee Synod Assembly, so Joe agreed to stay with Mike to monitor his health. Mary and I learned later that Mike had managed to get a cod dinner from Culver's, which was certainly forbidden on the strict diet that he had been given. So we puzzled about how did he get that cod dinner since he couldn't drive and, and certainly Joe would not have gotten that food for him from Culver's. We wondered, did, did Mike somehow figure out how to use DoorDash for delivery? <laughs> Later we learned that indeed he did get Joe DoorDash. <laughs> he had convinced Joe that since it was fish, it was healthy and was permitted on his diet. So today we remember fondly retired Lieutenant Michael Caldwell, a man of faith, a dedicated public servant, a loyal family man, and a friend, a child of God. Mike, you have now been sent to protect and serve in another plane of existence. Well done good and faithful servant. Rolf, thank you. And Mike's son, uh, Peter, also wanted to share some remembrances with you. And so, uh, Peter, we'll see what you've got in store for us here. <laughs> So, as many of you know, uh, Dad was meticulous about his lawn, and it was just the other day that I decided that Pastor John was no longer my favorite person because he told me I could not ride Dad's simplicity into the church and park it up front. <laughs> Something about fumes and that he just couldn't schedule that many funerals at Faith. Uh, he said one this week was enough. Uh, I want to start by uh, having my three boys uh, grab the purple bag here. And they are going to come and they are going to pass out some, uh, some baggies. In there, you're going to find uh, a, a Snickers bar. That was one of Dad's favorites. As well as two... Lifesaver mints. As a kid, when we would come to church, Dad always had a roll of Lifesavers in his pocket. And right before the sermon from Pastor Mock, he would give me a Lifesaver to make sure that I kept quiet during the sermon. <laughs> I won't call you out directly, but there are a few of you that are running through my mind that I hope the first thing you do is put that Lifesaver in your mouth today. One of the things you didn't know uh, with coming here was that you're actually going to get an education. That education is the Mike Caldwell Master Class on Yard Maintenance. First thing you need is like a textbook, it's his pair of fireman's boots. 42 years and I never got an explanation as to why on earth he had to wear fireman's boots all the time. So you know, this is not the pair that you saw sitting next to the tractor when you walked in. This is his spare pair. <laughs> oh wait, it's going to get better. So yes, make sure your first step is getting fireman's boots. The next step is you have to have multiple pairs of sweatpants, depending on the occasion. One time we went down to see Aaron, and Aaron the, literally the night before had had his appendix out. And the medication and the pain and the surgery, Aaron wanted to sleep understandably, so Dad and I went over to uh, the President Johnson Library and Dad and I are walking around. You may have seen, there's a picture of Dad uh, 
behind a backdrop of Abbey Road. If you look closely, Dad is wearing penny loafers, sweatpants, and a dress shirt. Uh, apparently, he never went to see George Zimmer at Men's Warehouse because that is not a guarantee that George Zimmer would have given. The, after the sweatpants, the next part, and this is, this is integral, is the Mike Caldwell comb over. <laughs> to let you in on a little secret, Every time dad was in the hospital, either mom or I would try and bribe the nurses with cash to come up with some sort of medical reason why that horrendous thing needed to be cut off. <laughs> and it just got worse over the years. It started off growing up here and then down here and then down to his ear. I, maybe it's a good thing he passed because he was running out of hair to... I don't know what his next option would have been. The other part, don't mind me, I forgot my double-sided tape to be able to keep that raccoon on my head. So we're just gonna set that down. The other part, making sure that the cop stereotype stayed alive was the Ray-Ban aviator sunglasses. Dad had three pair. He had his really good pair that would be for things like funerals, his everyday pair that he kept in the car, and then he had his yard maintenance Ray-Bans. When those broke, the car would get downgraded to the lawn maintenance, the really good pair would get downgraded to the car, and he would go and buy another pair. The other day when I stopped at Newman Chevrolet, I was talking to, uh, uh, talking to Chad at Newman, and as I'm walking out the door, he tells me that one thing he'll never forget is the god-awful elbow and shoulder length black leather gloves that Dad wore to drive the shuttle. I was told the heat worked in there, but I don't know, maybe he had a reason. Uh, these were the best pair that I found. among the 16 others <laughs> that I found. My BB gun as a kid went missing and I always swore that it was in the locked drawer that dad kept his sidearm in when he was still working. I now finally had the chance to go into that gun drawer to look for my missing BB gun. Inside there I found his badges, a couple of business cards from the police department from years ago, uh, all the pocket knives of mine that went missing over the years. <laughs> and the other thing that was most important to him to keep locked up was the receipts for his black leather gloves. <laughs> that was what was in his drawer. Something that I never told dad, many of you know that if you came over to the house there is gonna be one of just a few things on the TV. The Channel 12 News, because the word of Mark Baden is stronger than the word of a pastor. You could tell him, Dad is gonna, nope, Mark Baden said it's gonna be sunny today, even though he's looking out the window and watching it pour rain. Mark Baden said, that, that, was, that was what we heard all the time. The Brewers or the Bucks would be the other thing. But when there wasn't sports and it wasn't six o'clock to watch the news, dad had the Hallmark channel on. I think his biggest regret in death is that he didn't make it through July for Hallmark's Christmas in July special. <laughs> Something I never told him though, was I actually came across a casting call for a Hallmark Christmas movie and I signed him up. 
I wrote a bio for him. I made up a fake acting history, and I submitted a headshot. They never got back to me, though. <sighs> they missed out. They missed out. Lacey Chabert would have been so proud to work with Dad. But uh, we could, well, we, we've, covered, uh, we've covered summer and how Dad maintained the yard with his tractor. The, for those of you that, uh, that knew Dad, um, you know, you always saw him with the fireman's boots. Some of you have heard this story a dozen times the last couple of days, but when I was working at Direct Supply, I was talking with a coworker who had just moved to Cedarburg, and I asked him where he lived and figured out that it was across the street and behind the house across the street. And I said, oh, I grew up in the Brown Ranch. And he said, is that anywhere near the guy that mows his lawn wearing fireman's boots? No, I grew up in the house next door to him. I don't, I don't know who he is. But with, with summer maintenance, eventually life turns to winter maintenance. And dad would feel that it's never too early to start somebody with cleaning the snow off of the driveway. And he would encourage them to get leather snowmobile pants and a leather jacket so he looked like a winter version of a Hells Angels biker. But I'm going to ask my three boys to stand up and show you the official Mike Caldwell winter uniform. And I'm going to try to make sure I say this when I see all of you after, but thank you so much for coming. I don't see an empty seat, and that says a lot about Dad. Thank you, Peter. I still think I should have <laughs> We can talk about that. So there are family and friends who are going to help share the scripture readings for, um, for our time together here today. So I'd like to invite them to come forward. Um, Mike's uh, niece and nephew, uh, Matthew and Rachel Nervig, and Pastor Marilyn Miller uh, and Joe Dorr. And if you can all come up and have a seat and uh, thank you for helping us out and sharing these scripture readings. So this is not Matthew Nervig, this is Sarah Nervig. We are his goddaughters and nieces. Um, we're going to be reading Psalms 21, 121, I'm sorry. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where is my help to come? My help comes from the Lord. The maker of heaven and earth. The Lord will not let your foot be moved. Nor will the one who watches over you fall asleep. Behold, the keeper of Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade as your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day. Nor the moon by night. The Lord will preserve you from all evil. And will keep your life. The Lord will watch over your going out and your coming in. From this time forth forevermore. <clears throat> Romans chapter 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, 
holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion to faith. Ministry in ministering. The teacher in teaching. The exhorter in exhortation. The giver in generosity. The leader in diligence. The compassionate in cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering and persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. When Joyce asked me to read these three short verses, and I read through them for the first time, I thought, why on earth didn't I remember to read these to Mike in the last few times that we got together with him? But I didn't. And so I'm hoping as you hear them, you will realize that they are for us. They're for me and for you and especially for Joyce and Peter and Aaron and all the family members. So listen to these words from Jesus in Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, 
and my burden is light. The Gospel of the Lord. Thank you, readers, and I'm sorry about the mix-up there. <laughs> that was a wonderful sharing of God's Word to us here, and, uh, and I'm honored to offer some reflections. But before I do, I invite you to join me now in a word of prayer. O oh, Jesus, you who are gentle and humble of heart, who come into our lives into our circumstances, into our world, with love beyond our understanding, with grace that sees beyond uh, our shortcomings and failings, that sees us as you see us, as we truly are, as your family, your great family. Enfold us together in your love and compassion this day Enfold especially Mike's family and all who are grieving. Thank you for the power of love, for the opportunity to share it. Gather us together and help us to know the power of your love that has conquered death and raise us up to live in your beloved community. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Let the church say, Amen. Jesus said, For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I first met Mike at the airport in 2004 as my family and I my wife, Elisa, and our daughter, Olivia, arrived in Milwaukee for an interview at Faith Lutheran Church in Cedarburg. Mike was the chair of the call committee. And although we had spoken several times over the phone and we had realized some connections and the fact that Joyce and I had actually already met years earlier at an anti-racism training, this was my first encounter with Mike. And I'm not going to lie, I was a little nervous when I got off the plane. I didn't really know a whole lot about Cedarburg or what I was getting into here. And I didn't know what was ahead uh, with this whole experience. But I can tell you that I distinctly remember Mike's reassuring welcome. His enthusiastic kindness. And the unique composure of a retired cop as he drove us to our destination. <laughs> There's nothing quite like that, actually, riding along. I just was impressed by that. I knew nothing about Cedarburg, and my nervousness returned as we drove farther and farther from Milwaukee. And I remember wondering where on earth he was taking us. <laughs> this was a very different context from where I had been serving but its incongruity was offset by Mike's enthusiasm and his clear love for this community. And 19 years later, I've learned a little bit about what he was trying to share with me that day. It kind of all came tumbling out of him at once as he drove me all around Cedarburg and was pointing out places, this place and that place, and my head was just kind of spinning with all of this information, all of the people and places and stories and details that he was so eager to share with me. But I realize after all this time, those were the basis of a rich portrait of community that was inseparable from Mike himself. Over the years, my visits with Mike gradually began to center more around his health concerns. And we had several occasions to talk when he was in the hospital or when he was recovering from some medical issue. And I learned more about the seriousness of his heart condition and the heart attack that he had had before I had come here and its ongoing impact on his health. But I also learned about another aspect of Mike's heart through those conversations. 
In my er early years here at Faith, Mike had mentored me in working with staff. I came from, I have always been a solo pastor, and supervising staff was not really my strong point. And so Mike helped me develop my growing edges with his many years of experience in working with people. And I appreciated his sincerity, and I welcomed his doing that, but it was kind of tempered at the time by my own feelings of obligation, you know, that I was supposed to be listening to him, and, and the sense of duty, that this was something I needed to do, kind of like taking some medicine. Well, with time, my appreciation grew as I recognized how deeply this was part of Mike's identity, his sense of working with others and recognizing others and appreciating them. So as we sat there in the hospital, or as we sat there talking about some medical issue that he was dealing with, inevitably, our conversations would move away from whatever issue was affecting him to the myriad things that he was learning about the doctors and the nurses and staff who were helping him. Mike paid attention, like no one else I've ever known, to the details of their lives their gifts, their interests, their hopes, their dreams, their struggles, their joys. He remembered all of their names, and he could effortlessly and enthusiastically share their stories as part of his own. His years as a police officer had exposed him to all of the various sides of humanity, including the less admirable sides of our human nature. And Mike was not naive. He wasn't fooled by any of those things. I admired what a tough person he was. But he also was not a jaded person. And he was always looking for the best in others and finding ways to bring it out. The reading that we heard from Romans made me think of Mike's example an encouraging illustration of what it looks like to worship God with your whole self, with your body, with your abilities, with your sense of being part of a community, of being in relationship with others and the richness that that brings, with the circumstances of your life and the vocation that you've realized in the midst of it. While Mike found great fulfillment in the stories of the people that he encountered each day, his own story also had its share of burdens and pain. Our stories always do. And the wonder that continues beckoning us each day is that this is also where God meets you. The one who is gentle and humble of heart who shares God's realm amid the struggles and the limitations of our humanity, invites you to learn the surprising freedom of loving service, of compassion and care, and the unforeseen gift of rest for your soul. In Jesus, the astonishing promise of life is revealed in an empty tomb in the midst of humiliation and defeat, of confusion, betrayal, and fear. This promise encounters you in the complicated mess of life with the steadfast love and faithfulness of God who has chosen you, who dwells with you, and who will not let you go. In this promise, a distinctive community is formed around mutual love, through bearing of each other's burdens and celebrating our joys, held together even through death and encouraging you as you run this race. And when your race is run, it rejoices with you and welcomes you home. In my last words with Mike, I remembered with him that story of meeting him at the airport. 
of his welcome of me and my family that day. And I commended him into God's welcome and the fullness of eternal life. It's a love and a story that never ends, and you get to participate in it, church, just like Mike did. And it's one that's brought together in that great love that is bigger than us all, that holds you together, that holds me together, that holds us all together in something amazing and wonderful. The fullness of what we call eternal life, life that has no end. Thanks be to God for witnesses like Mike and for the love that joins us together in communion that never ends. Amen. So my own uh, attempt at a funny story here, as I sat by Mike's bedside, um, I was kept, he was hooked up to all these machines and it was kind of this long period of waiting and I thought, I'm just gonna read scriptures. And so we were reading scriptures and at some point Joyce said, well, maybe we should sing a hymn. <laughs> And then my mind started racing with I, hymns that I, and I was like, of course, when you're supposed to think of a hymn, I couldn't think of anything. So I thought of one eventually, and I said to Mike, Mike, do you want us to sing a hymn? And he was having a hard time talking, but he very distinctly went, no. <laughs> <laughs> no hymn. So I left about 10.30 that night, but later on, Joyce realized, oh, we have phones. And so the hymns that we're singing here this afternoon um, are hymns that they had played with Mike. And the one that they were playing when he drew his final breath was the one we're going to sing um, on Eagle's Wings. And so I invite you to stand as you're able and join in singing this together.
Thank you for sharing that, how good it is to sing together. You may be seated, um, and I invite you to join now together with the whole church in confessing our faith in the ancient words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, in holy baptism, you have knit your people together into one communion of saints in the body of Christ. Give to your whole church in heaven and on earth your light and your peace. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Grant that all who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection may die to sin and rise to share the new life in Christ. God of mercy, Give courage and faith to all who mourn and assure and certain hope in your loving care that casting all their sorrow on you, they may have strength for the days ahead. God of mercy. Grant to us who are still in our pilgrimage and walk as yet by faith that where this world groans in grief and pain, your Holy Spirit may lead us to bear witness to your light and life. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Help us in the midst of things we cannot understand to believe and trust in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to life everlasting. God of mercy, hear our prayer. God of all grace, we give you thanks because by his death, our Savior, Jesus Christ, destroyed the power of death and by his resurrection has opened the kingdom of heaven to all. Make us certain that because he lives, we shall live also, and that neither death nor life, nor things present nor things to come will be able to separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Let us commend Mike to the mercy of God, our maker and redeemer. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant, Mike. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. And we are going to sing Ascending Hymn, and again, I want to remind everyone that you are invited to join the family for more time of remembrances and refreshment uh, in our fellowship hall right out through these doors. And we join in Ascending Hymn, I was there to hear your morning cry. I invite you to stand as you're able as we sing that hymn.
Let us depart in peace in the name of Christ. Amen.